got my toys over there. Well, good morning, everyone. As you can see, I've got a great team assembled with me here today, and I am certainly grateful for each one of their service and their participation in this process. I'm here to speak today about our stay-at-home order that expires Thursday, April 30th. First, we couldn't even be here talking about this order that expires if it had not been for the people of Alabama abiding by the regulations and guidelines for their sacrifices, their patience, and their understanding during the last six weeks. What our citizens have done is working, and I appreciate that so many people have been willing to do to do the right things to keep themselves healthy as well as to protect others to be well and healthy too. And this has not been an easy process. And we are not well in a perfect world that we want to be. However, the people of Alabama are doing the hard things to ensure that we can get back to our routines just as soon as possible. And today, we're taking another step in that direction. Before I announce the changes that we're making, I'd like to first acknowledge a few people that are with me today. Dr. Harris continues to be a great partner in this venture, and I know it's not been an easy task, but I sure do thank you, Dr. Harris, for your wise counsel and your realistic approach as you have provided great leadership for us during this process. Your measured and balanced approach have given the people of Alabama confidence, the people that you and I both serve, and I know I'm not alone in expressing our gratitude for your leadership during this time. Dr. Harris has worked diligently to ensure that we have more testing capabilities. And as we work to begin re-entry into our workplaces and return to daily routines, it is essential that we keep monitoring those infected with the COVID-19. Reopening Alabama's economy is certainly not as simple as flipping a switch or snapping your fingers. Like any good leader should, I have sought counsel from many avenues and received many, many recommendations. In fact, these are just some of the many reports and suggestions that we've received in the last few days, from the Small Business Commission to each member of our congressional delegation in Washington. These suggestions are very broad and included many different scenarios, but I truly appreciate every one of them and the hard work and partnership that they represent. The seven members of the Executive Committee of my Coronavirus Status Force are here with me today, and these folks have been diligently working to help me incorporate these ideas into the plan. This Executive Committee, led by my Finance Director, Kelly Butler, has recommended to me a thoughtful, well-planned timetable on how we can open our economy back up. On April 30th, our current stay-at-home order will expire. Issuing this order in the first place was not something I did lightly, and it was extremely difficult to tell businesses to close their doors. But it was done out of a need to get a handle on the spread of this virus. On March 13th, I originally issued guidelines strongly urged recommendations, you might say, that if we all just did our part, then hopefully that would have been enough. At that time, I spoke about my reluctance to issue a stay-at-home order because I've always known that if the government kills a business, Washington can't print enough money to bring it back to life. I offered a solution that was based on the information we had at the time to slow the spread and to mitigate the once predicted hospital surge. Folks, I believe that all business is essential and truly regret any suggestion to the contrary. No matter the size, if you are conducting commerce and providing a paycheck, you have tremendous value to our state. On March 13th, we selected a list of specific businesses to remain open based on their 
risk of spreading the virus due to specific functions. Our intent was never to pick winners and losers, as some have wrongly suggested. We entered a safer at home recommendation on March 27 that we, had, we hoped would eliminate the need for a stay at home order. But unfortunately, it did not. For that reason, we enacted a stay at home order on April the 4th due to the continued spread of the virus and the fear of hospital surge. As of this week, we no longer believe our hospitals will see an overwhelming amount of ICU patients who need ventilators as we once believed, and that is sure good news for sure. While we have not seen a decrease in the amount of newly diagnosed COVID-19 patients, we have seen stabilization a leveling off, if you will, in the amount of cases. Like everyone else, I look forward to easing back into our routines with caution. Just like we eased into this current stay-at-home order, we will also be thoughtful and careful as we ease back into our social interactions. Today, I am announcing that we will once again enter a safer at home order that will still require social distancing and urge our people to continue taking all health precautions necessary as some people will return to the workplace. And while maintaining focus on our personal health, it's now time that we also focus on our economic health. And this too will be a thoughtful, methodical process. My fellow Alabamians, I am pleased to say that because of the efforts during these unprecedented days, we can roll back many of the restrictions that have been placed upon certain social gatherings and businesses. On April 30th at 5 p.m., our safer at home order will go into effect. All individuals and especially vulnerable persons are encouraged to exercise personal responsibility in slowing down the spread of COVID-19 by minimizing travel outside the home. You will be urged to wear face coverings around people from other households when you leave your house. Obviously, no one's going to arrest you if you don't, but it's just good, sound medical advice, and it's for your safety as well as for the safety of those with whom you come in contact. You are also urged to continue proper hand washing and other common sense hygiene. All non-work related gatherings of 10 persons or more or non-work gatherings of any size that cannot maintain a consistent six foot distance between persons are prohibited. However, some top level changes in this new order are as follows. Employers should take reasonable steps for employees to avoid gatherings of 10 persons or more, to practice social distancing and make strong efforts to disinfect their office space. Under this less restrictive order, all retail businesses will be allowed to open with a 50% occupancy rate and not allow customers to congregate within six feet of one another. Our state beaches will be open, providing people abide by social distancing and the gatherings guidelines. And the mayors of our coastal towns have assured me they will take the lead and be proactive in enforcing the gathering guidelines. Elective medical procedures can resume if providers take reasonable guidelines from their state regulatory boards or CDC guidance. My fellow Alabamians, let me be abundantly clear. The threat of COVID-19 is not over. We're still seeing the virus spread and all of our people are susceptible to the infection. The greatest disservice for the people who might be watching me here today is to think that by lifting the comprehensive health restrictions that this must be a sign that there's no longer a threat of COVID-19. Folks, we must continue to be vigilant 
in our social distancing both today and for the foreseeable future. And I encourage everyone to practice productive teleworking if possible and be as innovative as you can as you open your workplaces. Ensure you're taking every precaution while getting back to work. It's certainly been a challenging month for sure, but better days are ahead of us, I'm sure of that. And I just want to thank the people of Alabama for being disciplined and patient as we move into what I hope will be a better season for our state. Now let me call on Dr. Harris to give his update. Dr. Harris. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just uh, briefly remind you of where we are right now. We're uh, around 6,600 uh, confirmed cases. That's over the last uh, month and a half. Uh, with about 242 deaths uh, so far reported here uh, in Alabama. Uh, like we have mentioned to you before, um, we uh, see that our, our African-American Alabamians are disproportionately represented in those deaths. Uh, they represent close to half of those deaths. Uh, and that is because we believe uh, this disease does have a predilection for people that have chronic health problems, uh, diabetes and heart disease and seniors uh, and so on. And so we recognize that these are still vulnerable people uh, that we still need to uh, protect. Uh, and also, I, I certainly do agree, it's very reasonable for us to begin uh, a gradual opening uh, like this. We, I really appreciate Governor Ivey and what she has done on this. This has just been um, uh, really, really difficult decisions and she's done a terrific job of keeping everyone safe and trying to balance all those factors that are, that are important. Um, we uh, believe there are certain types of acti activities that it is safe for Alabamians to resume. Uh, clearly, people certainly do need to return to work, and we want to make that uh, as safe as we possibly uh, can do. Um, we feel like we have seen a number of improvements uh, recently, as the governor mentioned to you. Um, our, our case numbers are relatively flat. Uh, we uh, are somewhere around a couple of hundred cases uh, a day. Uh, over the past few days, we've seen numbers of uh, about 148, 209, 189, 261, and so on. So we, we occasionally are a little higher, a little lower, but tend to stay around uh, that baseline of, of around a couple of hundred cases a day. Um, the, the deaths that we have seen have been fairly flat as well. We continue to see some of those, unfortunately, but they're certainly not uh, accelerating at those rates like we uh, saw earlier on. Um, we're very pleased at how hospitals have been able to preserve their capacity. Uh, they uh, have not had ventilator shortages like we had thought or, or when they have had that short term, they've been able to share among themselves and manage that. We do have adequate ICU beds and the ability to care for people within, um, within the four walls of the hospital and have not needed uh, the alternative care sites that we had uh, prepared for. So, so all these things are very encouraging to us. Um, we, we've uh, mentioned more than once to you about the White House uh, gating criteria for moving to a, a phase one opening of the economy. Um, we uh, have met uh, two of those three gating criteria. We have not met all of those criteria. We, we feel good about the, uh, the, sin, the criteria related to symptoms, the criteria related to hospital capacity. We have yet to uh, meet the 14 day sustained decline uh, that is recommended in those guidelines. And I would say for that reason, uh, we are not um, proceeding to the full phase one opening consistent with the White House plan. The White House plan suggested opening uh, entertainment venues and gyms and restaurants and um, a number of other things that we're not doing at this time. Um, but we, we do think what the governor uh, mentioned to you earlier is, is uh, exactly the right approach. It's a, it's a very gradual and reasonable way for us to safely uh, get people back to work and get, get the economy going again. Uh, and we will continue to, uh, to monitor uh, the case numbers that we have. And as people get back to work and get back out in public again, um, we, uh, we certainly hope they can maintain the things that they need to do uh, to keep us all safe and healthy. We uh, believe that a gradual reopening makes a lot of sense. But as Governor Ivey mentioned, this really is up to the people of Alabama to keep doing the right thing as they have been doing so far. Um, 
I have appreciated so much the efforts that I've seen from people. Um, so many uh, folks have really done their very best to uh, make sure that they're keeping themselves safe and keeping their family members safe. And we realize that that has been done at great personal cost uh, for many of them. And so even as we open things back up, we need to continue to ask Alabamians to work with us to continue to do things a little bit differently uh, for the future. Uh, we, as the governor mentioned, we are going to recommend that people wear face coverings uh, like this or like those that you can make at home. Uh, when you're going to be out in groups of people that you're not related to or when you can't maintain a six foot distance between people. Um, for, for a number of reasons, this was not an order, uh, but this is a very strong recommendation and we think it's the right thing to do and we want all of you uh, to do that. This is the mask I wore in the car on the way up here and this is what I wear when I go out for, for takeout uh, and I would encourage all of you to, uh, to do those sort of things as well. Most importantly, um, it's remember that Please remember that we need to protect the most vulnerable people uh, in our society. Um, we have uh, seniors who represent about three quarters of all the deaths that we have seen so far. Uh, but we have a lot of people with chronic disease in our state, people with diabetes and with heart disease and with lung disease. And we know that those people, they're much more likely to do poorly uh, if they're exposed. So please keep that in mind, even if you don't feel that you yourself are at risk from this disease. Please think about your loved ones, think about those that you care about, uh, and, uh, and try to protect them as well. We know that we have uh, a ways to go to get completely back where we were, but I, I think uh, we're, we're moving in exactly the right direction and exactly the right speed. Uh, we know there are some close contact professions out there that we have not addressed today. Th those jobs where people uh, literally put their hands on their customers uh, are certainly uh, a risk category that's different from, from other types of businesses and we hope to be able to address that very soon. We know people continue to have a lot of questions about that. Um, I'll be glad to, to mention to you uh, later if you like about what we're doing around testing and contact tracing. Uh, we, we've uh, done uh, some uh, very good things in those areas and believe that we're moving in the right direction uh, there as well. So. Again, just a thank you to everyone for what you've done so far. We really appreciate all the efforts, and thank you, Governor Abbott, for what you're doing as well. Thank you, Dr. Harris. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Harris, uh, assisting Dr. Harris and me in sifting through all of these recommendations and bringing some perspective to all of this has been the executive committee of my coronavirus task force. These are the folks that are standing behind me today. Leading this group of distinguished men and women has been Alabama's finance director, Kelly Butler. Kelly will make a few words on behalf of the executive committee. And uh, if each member is interested and would like to introduce themselves and uh, make a brief remark, then when we get to the questions and answers, you can certainly ask all of the members uh, and they'll be prepared to take your questions. Director Butler. Thank you, Governor. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. I wanted to first uh, thank you, Governor and Dr. Harris, for establishing this committee of very distinguished uh, members of Alabama's community. We have two members who are medical doctors, accomplished medical doctors. Dr. Vickers is the current dean of the UAB School of Medicine, and Dr. Nancy Dunlop Johns is the retired dean of the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Uh, we have business leaders that were part of this committee, including Mr. Tim Vines, President and CEO of Blue Cross, uh, Secretary of Commerce Greg Canfield, Speaker Pro Tem, I'm sorry, President Pro Tem Marsh, uh, and Speaker McCutcheon, all very accomplished people. And as I like to joke, we had one accountant, which is me. Um, <laughs> I really believe that the makeup of the committee contributed to the, the debate that we had, the conversation that we had. Uh, the committee was able to draw on the expertise of these members, draw on the medical doctors for expertise when it came to those issues, draw on the business leaders uh, when it came to those issues, draw on the two highly elected state officials for all that leadership. And I believe that led to a careful approach in the committee's work. Uh, based as much as it could be on data and the expertise of the members. As the governor mentioned, we looked at 
uh, volumes of information, including the Small Business Commission report, recommendations from the congressional district members, uh, recommendations from legislators, business people, individuals. Our task was to review all that information along with the data on the fight against COVID-19 and make recommendations to the governor and Dr. Harris so that they could make the decisions they needed to make. Uh, the committee did produce a report and deliver that to them, and I believe um, that the process was helpful and useful, and I, I want to personally thank all the members of the committee for their time and effort that they put into this. And lastly, Governor, I want to thank you and Dr. Harris for your leadership throughout this and for, um, for your wisdom in, in seeking out guidance from as many people as you could. Thank you. Certainly we do thank the members of this committee for working so hard. Y'all poured through pages and pages and pages of documents and recommendations. Folks here in Alabama, one out of two adults in Alabama attend some type of church or religious worship service. Faith is clearly a part of the thread of the people of Alabama. And getting back to worship services is essential as we maintain our spiritual and mental health during this coronavirus pandemic. Like so many others who call on a pastor or a priest or a rabbi in good times or bad, I often turn to my pastor and friend, Dr. Jay Wolf. However, getting back to these services must be done with very much concern. Last week, as we were discussing this effort to reopen Alabama safely, I asked Jay, if he would reach out to his network of friends across the state from all different denominations, from all parts of the state. And I wanna ask Dr. Wolf to come forward now to share the consensus of what many of our religious leaders from throughout Alabama are feeling at this time. Dr. Wolf. Thank you so much, Governor Ivey. We thank God for you and for allowing us the privilege of contributing to your decision-making process regarding reopening houses of worship in Alabama. Like you, Governor Ivey, we simply want to honor the Lord, help and protect God's people, and do what is right and responsible. Our task force was asked to provide for Governor Ivey some helpful and common sense considerations for reopening houses of worship across Alabama in accordance with the White House and CDC recommendations. These guidelines were compiled by a team of ministers, lay leaders, and medical personnel, and in particular, Dr. Don Williamson, who was the head of the Alabama Public Health Department for many years, was our primary guide. The process for reopening churches for large in-person gatherings must proceed gradually and in a measured fashion because COVID-19 has proven to be a highly contagious and very dangerous enemy. We must reopen in a way that will not inadvertently facilitate an outbreak of this virus. Many sad stories from other states have emerged where COVID-19 has spread through a congregation and even taken the lives of pastors and created community outbreaks. The CDC is recommending a three-phased approach to reopening houses of worship. It is our opinion that the CDC guidelines should be followed. Please visit www.whitehouse.gov opening America, and they will give you current information. Now at this time, Alabama does not meet the criteria proposed by the CDC for reopening houses of worship for large in-person gatherings. Reopening our places of worship will be a process, not an event. According to the CDC, as the number of infections go down, then the number of people who can safely gather will go up. Consequently, at this time, we are recommending that Alabama follow the guidelines of the White House and the CDC and affirm that in-person corporate gatherings and in-person small groups are not currently 
advisable. However, churches are encouraged to continue doing God's vital work of connecting with people by using creative online services for worship, meetings, and ministries. Let's keep connected to people through technology tools. Let's use innovative serving projects. Let's also use the highly effective drive-up worship services, but it is not yet safe and wise to gather in person. Now, when the number of new COVID-19 patients and infections decline, then in accordance with the CDC guidelines and timelines, larger in-person groups can safely meet. But to reopen at this juncture could facilitate outbreaks of infections that could tragically harm our neighbors and set Alabama's progress back. As we prepare to reopen places of worship in the future, which will be based on the standards specified by Alabama's public health officials, you are encouraged to consider and following the guidelines that are a helpful game plan designed to assist your congregation prepare for a safe reopening in the coming days. Thank you so much, Jay. Now before we open up for questions, let me go ahead and answer one question that I know is on y'all's minds today. And that is, what about restaurants and barbershops and others like that that have been closed? When will they be able to open? Well, first of all, when we started talking about what to reopen and what to close, I want to go on the record that I said to Dr. Harris that in my opinion, hairstylists, or at least mine, are essential to the functioning of state government. I look forward to getting back to my hair salon. On a serious note, we will be working proactively with the State Cosmetology Board, the Alabama Restaurant Association, and other boards and associations to address every business that is currently on our list of higher risk businesses that are still closed. Some of these are regulated by the health department, such as tattoo portals and restaurants, but we know there are still more questions than we've got answers for today, like summer camps and gyms and bowling alleys. Y'all, today is the, or the beginning of our new State Safer at Home order. It will be the first phase of what we hope and expect will be a multi-phase reopening of our state. And as I've said repeatedly, we know that what we are announcing today will please some, and will make others frustrated that we're not going further at this time. But our job must be always to find the right balance, keeping our people safe and healthy, as well as focused on the economic health of the state. Now I'm happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. I hadn't talked to any of this, my fellow governors from the other states about this particular order. This has been developed with the input from our small business commission, our uh, congressional delegation, and constituents from their districts, as well as our executive committee behind me pouring through and fared to now. So this is a, an Alabama developed, an Alabama prepared uh, step we're taking today. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Harris, can you address, the, as you said before, the testing situation, in particular, some of the disparities we've seen, uh, particularly in rural areas like the Black Belt and the Wiregrass? Like, what, what is the state of testing right now in, in Alabama? The question is, what is the state of the testing, especially in the Black Belt areas? And the Wiregrass, yes, ma'am. And the Wiregrass. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, that, um, we, we believe we've continued to increase capacity quite a bit. Um, our county health department teams are doing clinics in all of these counties, not every county every day, but they're traveling to, to do those in, in, every, in every county, uh, certain days of the week at least. Um, we uh, have, have been in discussions recently with uh, our uh, federally qualified health center, our community health centers. You may be aware that uh, nationally uh, they were awarded about $400 million last week by Congress for COVID activities and, and much of that we think can be used to uh, work with testing and, and possibly with some other activities as well, for example, contact tracing as well. Uh, but we know that our FQHCs are located in most counties in the state. There were a lot of people go to get their uh, health care. 
uh, and we think that they will be excellent partners uh, in helping us to, to do that. Um, there have been some other initiatives. The governor's office has actually been working with Walmart, as you know, to do some mobile testing sites, and they've been doing that uh, in Jefferson and Montgomery counties, but um, are also going to, uh, to Dallas County, to Clark County, to Marengo County, I believe. Uh, and so they'll be uh, providing some availability there. Uh, the, the real issue with testing is not the total amount of tests we have out there available in the state. Uh, if, if you add up all the capacity of all the labs, we probably have enough people to run tests, but it's really about access. It's about having the testing in the, in the right place. Um, in the past week, uh, those of us in public health have reached out to every person who has submitted lab results to us, every lab that submits lab submit some test results and sort of ask them about their capacity and how many labs they can run and what barriers do they have for increasing their, their testing. And really the, the problem is just an uneven distribution of tests. Um, it, it's definitely a barrier for people in rural areas to have to go see a provider and get a test order, but then maybe have to travel somewhere else in another part of the town or another, even another part of the county to get tested. So we're working on ways to make it so that testing can be uh, done in accordance with where, where people get their care, and that's really going to be the solution to the problem. Governor, we just received word that at least one business in the Birmingham area has decided they're going to open tomorrow a salon. What is the state's response going to be to businesses that decide to defy your state? That's the new order that you're implementing this uh, I didn't hear all of your questions. We, we received word that there was a business in the Birmingham area that's planning to open Friday. It's a salon, even though they're on this list that must remain closed. They plan to reopen anyway. What is the state's response going to be to those that decide to defy this order? Well, these are, these are orders that if, if they are violations, they are subject to a $500 fine, etc. So I would encourage them to rethink that strategy. Yes, sir. Uh, but funeral services are still limited to um, no more than 10 people, six feet apart. There have been some states that have reported they've had issues with acquiring some of those supply chain items such as swabs and materials needed to transport the test. Has Alabama seen that issue or do you anticipate that may become an issue here? The question has to do with acquiring testing materials. Um, I think that's been an issue for all states for as long as we've been involved in this response. Um, we continue to have some supply chain issues and we, we try to source those materials everywhere that we can. Uh, we, we wish we had better access to testing materials. We're doing the most with, with what we have. We are sort of working through our own channels uh, and the governor's office has a team that, that's been terrific in helping us find those uh, products in places that we, we don't even know where to look uh, in public health. Uh, so right now we're, we're stable with that. We, we do feel like a lot of time we have sort of just-in-time inventory, like we're, we're not sure if we can test tomorrow, but then at the last minute we find, you know, manage a way to do that. So, so, so we've not had any um, complete interruptions, but it, it, it's still you know, a bit of an uh, issue every single day to make sure we have what we need. Mike. Governor and Dr. Harris, when will you reassess the issue of restaurants and barbershops and those type of businesses? And will that depend on the 14-day decline? And also, how is that measured? Is that hospitalization or is that number of new tests? The measurements are of several criteria, not just one um, category of measure. So you look at vacancies of hospital beds, how many folks on ventilators or not on ventilators, ICU beds, et cetera. And so we look at a, a cluster of factors to measure things. We'll be, we've already started making um, inroads to the Restaurant Association. We're, they're going to be getting with us uh, this week or first of next to provide some recommendations. So we'll be addressing beauty shops and uh, restaurants very soon. Well, we trust the businesses of the state to, to be good citizens, and we, I believe that most of them are trying to do that and do what's right. Uh, and so I just, I have not heard of it, anybody really personally complaining about not doing it. So I think our business owners are responsible, and they want to be healthy too, and they want their employees to be healthy. Governor. Yes, ma'am. Is the amount of 
the personal protective equipment available a factor in whether or not you're going to allow close contact services and restaurants to reopen? Will the availability of PPEs? Well, I hadn't had my meetings with the restaurant folks yet, so uh, that we'll certainly consider all factors, <laughs> uh, but we just haven't addressed that particular aspect of it yet. Governor, there's obviously people that wanted to go further than this and do something like Georgia. Is the reason that we're not going further because we haven't meet, met all of the, the White House needed criteria? I think Dr. Harris said we met two of the three. Do we need to meet all three? Well, we need to meet more of the criteria than we have thus far. And this is a beginning of a reopening effort. Uh, once we reopen this, we're outlining with all retailers being able to have 50% open and have 50% occupancy and uh, limited access to our beaches and uh, press on with um, elective medical procedures. We'll see how this trend lasts, but we're, we're moving forward. Let's see, gentleman back there in the white shirt. Governor, will there be a high school football season in 2020? And if so, will our high school athletic facilities be open for training in June? Well, high school facility, uh, foot. They have all season training and weights and running and passing and throwing all through the summer. Well, this is the end of April, and so we've got some time to track our progress as we begin this limited reopening. So we are hopeful, but I can't speak with specifics on that issue yet. Yes, sir. Question for Dr. Um, you know, part of what a lot of uh, experts are talking about is in terms of getting ahead of the disease, the tracing aspect, how things are going. Can you speak to that? Because we really haven't talked about that much. Sure. So the, the question has to do uh, with contact tracing. Um, I, I think most of you are aware of how that works, but contact tracing is something we have always done in public health for a lot of diseases. When we um, locate certain diseases of public health significance, particularly ones that spread person to person, then we get in touch with all of the people who are around that case and let them know that they may have been exposed and give them advice about what they can do or should do or, or to look out for. And so that, that's a really important part of what we do with COVID-19 because it is spread person to person. So uh, with, with the 6,500 or so people that uh, have been diagnosed so far, we have contacted all of them and we attempt to get, gain from them, learn from them who lives at home with them and what type of workplace they're in. And in, in many cases, we have to contact the workplace in case uh, there are other exposures. Um, you can imagine that this is an enormous task because every person may have, uh, you know, dozens or scores of contacts that need to be, need to be traced. So, what all states have identified is that the way really to get ahead of this is to make sure you're doing that on the scale that you need to do. Um, you, you may uh, have seen where Massachusetts, for example, just hired a thousand people to do this sort of work um, for, for a state of that size. We, we are going to use a number of different strategies to do that. Uh, we have already moved a lot of our staff internally. I, I believe I've spoke to you all about it before, uh, maybe last week, but we normally have less than 10 people who are doing uh, a lot of this outbreak work for us. We've moved a lot of staff internally and now have between 50 and 60 people who are doing that work. But we have also uh, got volunteers uh, who are helping us from uh, uh, medical students, for example, or School of Public Health students as well, who uh, can do that for at least for a while. We clearly will need to find some additional resources. And, and I, I mentioned a moment ago, we've had discussions with our, our community health centers about their ability uh, to help us with that as well. There are uh, phone banks that we use for a lot of survey work that have uh, HIPAA trained operators who are used to calling people and asking them questions and asking them about medical things that we can use kind of as we need, need uh, to. Uh, and, and there are also some, some kind of really interesting um, electronic means uh, that uh, have been designed by some of our um, big tech companies in the U.S. and in the world. There's a, a product uh, from uh, Microsoft that I know Dr. Vickers knows a lot about 
uh, Google and Apple have a product that they've been working on. There are some others that we have looked at specifically, and, and that involves uh, tra tracking people based on their cell phone and allowing them to put information in and who their contacts are so that they can be reached in a real efficient way. So. Ultimately, um, I think we'll uh, probably use some of all of those strategies um, because we'll have to, until we have a vaccine or at least an effective treatment, uh, we'll have to scale that up quite a bit for a while. So. said about two weeks ago there were 120 people who were doing the contract the contact tracing. If you look, there are six, about 6,000 cases. Obviously, simple math shows that that's just not enough. How confident are you that ADPH will be able to identify and isolate those infected so that we don't see another surge in the coronavirus once we start phasing in these businesses? I, I, I think we have a lot of concerns about that. Um, it's very important that we're able to do that. And, and one of the distinctions we make when we get a new case is do we have a new case that's linked uh, epidemiologically to another case? That is, if you have an infected person, is it because we know they live in the house with someone who's infected? Because that's a case we can explain. Or is it a case that just acquired it without any known exposure? We would say a non-epi-linked case. Those are the ones that concern us because those are the ones that tell, tell us that there's community transmission going on, that people uh, got infected without having any known exposure or just going about their, their normal everyday life. So in addition to seeing those numbers improve, we really want to make sure that those non-epi-linked cases are the ones that are going down. And, and they actually have been, although they're just not at the level we'd like to see. So. Contact testing. Um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of ways to calculate that. Um, we we need a certain amount of FTEs, which may not be a certain amount of people, and certainly doesn't mean public health employees. Uh, but we we need um, hundreds uh, of FTEs to do it, and. There are certainly some turnkey solutions out there. There are companies that are just professional contact tracing uh, companies uh, that you can contract as you need to. And I, I think what we anticipate in the future is that we uh, will probably be able to manage our workload with a certain amount of capacity, but we may see an occasional outbreak. If you have a nursing home uh, infection, for example, or you have a workplace infection like we've seen recently, um, and then you may need to add that additional capacity like on a contract.